Hey everyone, welcome to another virtual activity. This time we are talking all about water. But more than that, we are going to discuss the careers that monitor and protect this water uh, and how they help to keep us safe. So whether it's sustaining our, our people or our wildlife, clean water is critical to maintaining a happy and healthy community. And today, we will speak to those who focus their career on water conservation, pollution, and climate change. Our panelists all work for the California Water Boards, but are also a part of an organization called PEG, and that stands for professional, it's P-E-C-G, Professional Engineers in California Government, and we'll get into what those organizations are a little bit later. But first, I do want to introduce our panelists today. Starting off, we've got Devin Jorgensen. She's an engineering geologist at North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. You all have very long titles, by the way. Tim, Tim Chow is a water resource control engineer at State Water Resource Control Board. And Carmina Padgett is the same, a water resource control engineer at the State Water Resource Control Board. So welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. As we, uh, or I should say before we get started, I do want to dive into, no pun intended, to uh, what the water boards are and what PEG is. And so Devin, I believe you have uh, some slides you're gonna share just to kind of give us an overview of, of what the water boards are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, thanks Brandon for having us. I know we're all excited to talk about our awesome careers protecting California's waters. All right. So the California Water Boards, um, or the state agency responsible for protecting, enhancing, and um, restoring water quality in California, as well as um, allocating water resources. Um, and there are a number of different divisions within the water boards. We have the Division of Water Quality, um, which is comprised of the nine different regional water boards that you see here on the screen. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and so each of these water boards um, permit different um, anthropogenic activities to ensure that water quality is protected, both surface water and groundwater. Um, and so this could be things like construction sites um, to ensure that um, dirt isn't mixed with water and discharged from sites into waterways. Um, it could be ensuring that um, certain gas stations um, and the storage tanks underground don't leak gas into our groundwater, um, regulating agricultural activities, um, basically all types of activities to ensure that our water quality is protected. Um, we also have the Division of Water Rights, um, which oversee um, water rights and water allocation to ensure that everyone in California and the environment um, are using water efficiently and um, water is properly allocated to um, everyone here in California for long-term sustainable use. Um, we have the Division of Financial Assistance, um, which helps provide um, grants and funding to various projects um, to help support and maintain water quality and other water resources throughout the state. Um, and then we have the Division of Drinking Water, which ensures that our drinking water is safe um, for everyone here in California. Um, so that's a, a really quick overview um, of the water boards. Um, and Carmina or Tim, if you guys have anything to add, please feel free. I work specifically for the Division of Water Quality. Um, so my knowledge is a bit biased towards that. Yeah, no, thanks, Devin. And just to chime in real quick. So I work for financial assistance. Um, and then Tim is with Water Rights. So you have us placed in uh, different sections of the water boards. Um, yeah, but I think you did a great job with the overview. Very cool. Thank you so much, Devin. 
Now, Carmina, I believe you uh, are going to give us a little bit of an overview about what the professional engineers in California government is, because that's a separate organization that you all are a part of as well. And I'm curious at, uh, how that ties into it all. Yeah, exactly. So I'll talk about PEG, Professional Engineers in California Government. Um, so at the end of the day, we are a labor union. Uh, and that means basically that we're just a group of workers that buy into uh, the union so that we can make decisions collectively about uh, different workplace or social justice issues. Um, PEG specifically represents about 13,000 state employees, and we are all engineers or related professionals. So that could mean a geologist. Um, we have a few state architects as well in our group. Um, but yeah, so we're 13,000 under one bargaining unit. And uh, we consider that the like PEG corporate or the larger umbrella. And then underneath that, we have different sections. So then the section that you're talking to today with Tim, Devin, and I is the River City section. Um, and that is more specific to water boards employees in Sacramento. Um, so you have those two distinctions. But other labor, or sorry, other... Uh, sections can be, you know, based in other parts of the state and represent different types of employees. So like air resource engineers or um, state architects, stuff like that. Um, but, but yeah, so PEG overview is uh, engineers and that work for the state at the end of the day. Okay. And all of you are more on the water side, but that could be plenty of other focuses with with the rest of PEG, right? Exactly. Okay. So anything from air quality, um, we have a lot of Caltrans employees as mm -hmm. well. So if you're interested in pursuing a career in transportation services, you might also be represented by PEG. Uh, clean energy uh, is also, or we have positions in the energy commission so that they'd be like energy engineers or um, something like that. Uh, but the names differ. But basically anything in water, um, air, environmental services, uh, working for the state. Okay. Now, I, I want to get a little bit more in depth about your individual careers. And um, now, Carmina and Tim, you, you both are water resource control engineers. Now, I'm hoping you can explain what you do in your career and how you work to address important factors like water pollution, climate change. Um, and protecting natural natural resources. Um, Tim, do you mind starting since we haven't heard from you yet? Yeah, sure, I can give it a go. So with me, I work for the Division of Water Rights and what that really means is we manage a lot of California's water resources. You can kind of see us like a, like a bank and we're essentially managing water instead of managing money. So when, when a farmer wants to come in and take water from, let's just say the Sacramento River, they would go through us and make sure that there's gonna be water in the river and that it's not gonna impact any of the environment where the water is being diverted as well as downstream. So for me as an engineer, I'd be looking at those environmental analysis to make sure that there aren't gonna be any environments that are impacted from this farmer that's gonna be taking water from the rivers. And right now, a lot as our division as a whole, we're looking at figuring out how to incorporate climate change. And because the science there is little, is established, but we're trying to figure out how to incorporate into our process. So we're trying to account for climate change in our environmental analysis, as well as drought, which has been a reoccurring thing in California's history. Those are two major things that we're trying to create more governance on so that we can better protect the environment and create a more sustainable state. My apologies, I was muted. Um, now, Carmina, you're a water resource control engineer as well. Um, how does your job differ and how is it similar? 
Yeah. So my role is different than Tim's in that I deal with the money. Um, He made the analogy that he deals with uh, water as a bank. Well, I'm more literally dealing with financing um, projects. So I work in the division of financial assistance and most of my work is related to to clean drinking water projects um, for communities that are considered disadvantaged. So, you know, low socioeconomic status. Um, And what I do is use taxpayer dollars or state funds uh, to finance these smaller projects, usually in the Central Valley, but really all over California, um, to make sure that uh, people have clean drinking water um, coming from their taps. So the process is a little, it's different, um, yes, than Tim's, but it's the same in that we're still making sure that, you know, water is making its way into the hands of Californians and that it's uh, safe to drink and that we're uh, keeping track of it all. Now, Devin, um, you're an engineering geologist, so Sounds, sounds like quite a bit different. I'd be curious to know what you do to address pollution, climate change, and natural resources. Yeah, so um, my role with the North Coast Regional Water Board is a bit different than Carmina and Tim's at the State Water Board, um, although we still have the same objectives of um, preventing um, and mitigating pollution and climate change impacts. Um, But I work um, on regulating timber harvest activities. And so I work up in Northern California in the mountainous areas where a lot of this logging occurs. Um, And, you know, as we know, logging is an essential part of our economy. You know, we need timber for lots of things but we also need to ensure that there aren't significant environmental impacts associated with doing that. And so as a geologist, I will inspect these proposed timber harvest plans to ensure that slope stability isn't compromised. Um, So evaluating landslides and evaluating how their proposed plan might discharge sediment or a bunch of dirt to water courses, which has a lot of adverse impacts, um, including affecting aquatic habitat, affecting um, a river's geometry, and it can also affect um, drinking water intakes. Um, And so my um, program is talking a lot about how we address climate change because climate change is exacerbating these really large wildfires that we're seeing in the North Coast. Mm -hmm. And those sometimes will burn, you know, tens of thousands of acres. And when you do that, you're removing all of the trees and you are affecting the soil so that a lot more sediment can be discharged to the rivers. Um, And so we're trying to figure out how we as a regulatory agency have the capacity to Um, minimize some of these climate change induced impacts in these really large wildfires. You know, the thing that stands out hearing all three of you is um, kind of how different, I mean, you you know, we first approached this uh, panel, you know, and I said, we're talking about water today. Um, And I purposely was broad and vague on what that was. Um, But I think it's so interesting because Water, just clean water, or you know something like that, or uh, our, our natural resources in our uh, in our forests or in our lakes. It, it's something that people don't really think about, even if it well, clean water is coming right out of the tap. You don't really think about how much had to go into getting that clean water, uh, well cleaned, and where it came from, and you don't have to think about what it takes to pump it into your house, right? And so it's it's so interesting that there behind something as basic as water. But also as important as water, there are thousands of unique jobs just like yours. Um, And I think that's so interesting. Um, But it also leads to my next question, which is, um, what was it that 
made you want to pursue this career? I mean, was it something that you kind of always wanted to do or did you somehow fall into it? Um, and maybe uh, Carmina, maybe you can start us out. I, I'd just be curious on, on what made you pursue um, your career. Yeah, uh, so my interest stemmed from some of my extracurriculars in college. So I knew I wanted to study environmental engineering uh, just because I love the environment and was okay at math and science. And my parents kind of pushed me to do uh, engineering. But within environmental engineering, you can still choose uh, water, you can energy. There's still a lot um to choose from. And so what drove me to, cho to choose water in specific uh, was like a statistic back, you know, it's been about 10 years since I've been in college, but um, back then the statistic was that like 1 billion people at any given point are not drinking clean water all over the world. And uh, that was brought up in a a club called the Columbia Aquanauts. It's kind of nerdy, but anyway, I then started to dig deeper into what that actually meant um, and felt like, wow, okay, here we have a serious issue and, and what can I do to actually make a little dent in, in that number? Um, and so I found my way to the state water board and find that I'm doing work that kind of aligns with that same mission or that same thought process that I had uh, back in college. And I mean, that's kind of what keeps me going as well in every day, uh, not necessarily struggle with working, but um, especially working for like a state agency, sometimes it can feel like progress is slow. So even just staying or reminding myself of that uh, statistic and, and how I can continue to work at that uh, keeps me going. Maybe slow, but so important. Um, and, and, and I, I think uh, you point, pointed to something that I, I would assume a lot of students are wrestling with right now, which is, um, do I, you know, how do I follow my passion and make that a career? Um, so I, I'm, I, I think it's really interesting that you say that. And I think a lot of students are considering that same thing. Um, Tim, can we go to you next? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, it was somewhat of a similar path. For me, I've always been passionate about the environment. Um, Growing up, I knew I wanted to do something related to STEM. My father w was an engineer and he was, let's just say very persuasive in pushing me into the engineering field. He was an electrical engineer. My brother ended up being an electrical engineer. So he wanted, my father wanted me to do something electrical, mechanical, but for me, like I had to settle for environmental. That was the only type of engineering that interested me. And just going through college, um, in hindsight, I realized more and more how much I enjoyed it. With the engineering program I was a part of, you could really take a route into water pollution control technologies or air pollution control. And I had both feet in both curriculums to the ending days of my college, um, my college career. And I really had the opportunity to go into air or water, but I really liked water and just a lot of the jobs that I've had outside of college dealt dealing with water treatment, new um, water treatment technologies, water quality, and understanding how important water is to our society. Like I really do find that I really like my job and just have being involved with the water community. Um, so overall, I'm pretty happy with where I'm at right now. And then um, back to you, Devin, um, why did you decide to pursue your career? Uh, yeah, so I actually spent most of my early childhood and through high school and early college wanting to pursue um, something in the medical sciences. And I went to a bunch of, you know, medical camps and biology camps when I was in high school and younger and started out college as a pre-nursing major. And my freshman year, I just found that I wasn't excited by class and my um, schooling, and I just wasn't super motivated. And I'd always loved learning, so I kind of found that as um, uh, an issue and something that kind of spurred me to, you know, evaluate whether biology was something that I was really wanting to do. 
And so at this point, I had to totally reassess, you know, what was it that made me happy? What did I want to do in a job? And so I was out hiking and I was just so excited to be outside. And I thought, man, I really want a job where I can be outside. Um, And so that directed my attention to geology, um, where I was able to spend, uh, you know, weeks and weeks in the field, travel all over the state. Um, I went to South Africa and studied geology. um, And so that was really exciting. And then I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. I was able to find a job um, that allowed me to do just exactly that. And so these are some photos of various um, places in the field. Um, And so down in the bottom, you can see my truck with the ATV in the back. And so I actually get to ride around ATVs for work um, and check out all of these awesome places. And it really being out in the field really makes me appreciative of, you know, everyone who is working to protect water quality and just how awesome my job is and how sensitive and important our environment and clean water are. Well, thank you, Devin. Um, I appreciate that. So the, for my next question, I want to focus on how students can start on a path into water conservation or climate protection. And so I'm hoping that um, you each can explain the kinds of skills and um, maybe education, like what you you had to do or what others in your field have to do um, in order to enter in and be successful in these kinds of careers. Um, And I I think, uh, Tim, I'll start with you this time. Um, What kind of, uh, so it's a two-part question, what kind of skills Uh, do you think are important in your career, but also what kind of education is needed? Okay, Um, with skills, I would say a good foundation in math and science would be very beneficial and advantageous in engineering, but I wouldn't say those are necessarily, um, you don't necessarily have to be the greatest at them. I feel like just a good understanding of it is adequate. One of the things that I'm realizing more and more as I'm logging on more use of work is your ability to communicate is extremely important. You can understand all the science in the world, but if you don't understand how to communicate that information to get the public to buy into what you're trying to say or the policies that you're trying to propose, it's not gonna be as successful. So being able to communicate, I would say is really an important skill to develop. And there's multiple ways you can do that. you can, I think the easiest way for students would just to be able to raise your hand, ask questions. That's a very low key form of voicing your opinions, voicing your concerns. And it's also a good way for you to learn from situations as well. Um, could you repeat the second part of uh, that just, question? Yeah, schooling, education. Uh, I assume that uh, you each had to have some sort of post-secondary education um, or maybe even a more particular training focus? Yeah, um, I would generalize a lot of engineering programs. It's usually a four-year program. You get to decide on what type of engineering there are or en- what type of engineering you want to pursue. There's a lot of various types of engineers out there. I would say if you want to get more into the environmental field, there are, I would say, civil engineering covers a broad spectrum of um, the environmental field, but you also could look in electromechanical, if you wanna dive more into the energy sector, there's a lot of innovation that could be done on that end as well. But I would generalize to say that in many types of environmental or many types of engineering, you could really, the lot of skills you develop there are transferable to the environmental field. Mm-hmm. And would you say that you could go through and uh, you know, if, if you were gonna be something like a civil engineer, it just opens up the, the path to a handful of those opportunities is kind of what you're, what I'm hearing you say? I would say so. There's okay. a, civil engineering is a pretty broad form of engineering and it does open up a lot of doors. 
yeah, whether it's still, to... yeah, whether it's still well, like water resources, transportation. Okay. And I, I like the fact that you mentioned communication. Um, I work with a lot of employers and that is like, that is pretty much number one for a lot of employers on the, uh, as far as like the softer skills, right? The kind of skills that uh, it doesn't really, you know, we're not talking like training, but like just the general skill to be willing to ask the questions, like you say, um, and be able to work in a team and communicate with your teammates. I think that's important. Um, mm -hmm. Devin, do you mind going next and, and talking about what you think some of the important skills are, um, as well as maybe the education that you had to go through? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a little bit different for geology compared to engineering. Uh, we geologists do a bit less math, um, depending on your discipline. But when you are pursuing a degree in geology versus engineering, geology will typically have um, a lot less math. So if math is something that kind of terrifies you, which to some degree it terrifies me, um, then, you know, geology is something, you know, that you could consider. Um, but with that said, you know, um, math and other, you know, um, skills are necessary. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, like Tim said, just, kind of curiosity um, and a willingness to ask questions and be comfortable with not knowing things and being okay with that and just a desire to kind of explore and learn more um, is really important. Um, and so, you know, I encourage everyone to not be afraid of, you know, science or math because they think they aren't, you know, good at it or whatever, because, you know, you can always grow into things um, and you just, you know, ask questions um, and that will take you a long way. Yeah, thank you. And then um, Carmina, um, what do you what do you think are some of those skills uh, that it would be needed as well as maybe you can let us know what you did for your education to get where you are? Yeah, well, so just piggybacking off uh, what Devin said about, you know, not necessarily needing to have this strong foundation in math and science. I completely agree with that. I feel like um, a lot of people opt out of strong sciences like engineering because they're a little bit uh, hesitant on their math skills. I would say pursue it, even if you have the smallest inkling in or yeah, curiosity in like building things or in managing things at the end of the day. If you enjoy uh, taking on little household projects or taking on or helping out your parents with um, whatever projects they're working on, that is a, a really essential skill, project management uh, in, in the work that I do and in the work that, that Tim and, and Devin do as well. Um, and then in terms of my educational background, so uh, bachelor's degree, but you know I was uh, undecided kind of going in um, as to what type of engineering, but beyond that, uh, it's just kind of been various like extracurriculars that have helped me build. Another important skill, which I feel is customer service uh, in working for state government. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is with outside, you know, stakeholders. And so I found that it's really important to remember that, you know, we are serving uh, the public and that we represent um, the state government in that sense. So, yeah, everything we do revolves around uh, making the clients or our uh, citizens of, of California happy. You know, I want to touch on a couple of things that you had mentioned um, as far as some of those soft skills. They all um, they all are a part of something called the Sonoma County Portrait of a Graduate. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of that, but it's um, something that uh, something that employers and educators are really looking at to try to make sure that when a when a when a student graduates high school that they come out with some of these important skills. Um, and I want to actually share my screen for a second to show you some of these skills. 
curiosity you mentioned, communication was on there. We talked about kind of uh, collaboration, like working in a team. So there's a lot here that, that students should consider. Um, I think these are some of the most critical skills to enter into any career. Yeah, I, um, I like that empathy was on that because mm -hmm. that is something that is really integral to um, effective communication, but also just uh, for leadership, you know, empathy is, you know, one of the foundational skills for leadership. Um, and, you know, as you are going through your career, you might find that you're interested in pursuing leadership roles. Um, so, you know, having, um, you know, empathy um, and, you know, a strong sense of, of ethics, like was also on there is, is really important. So as, as my final question, before we wrap up, I really want to kind of get a general and, and brief piece of advice from each of you, because the students that are watching this are generally going to be in their high school range, right? Grades nine to 12, mostly. And they're starting to explore careers. And a lot of them have a passion for, you know, um, environmental sustainability and, and, and overall mitigating climate change, stuff like that. So I'd love to hear a piece of advice from, from each of you um, for these students that are kind of thinking about their careers. Um, Carmina, do you mind if we start with you? And then I'm gonna go Tim and then Devin. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say maybe just choose, you know, one aspect of environmental or uh, if you're interested in water or energy, um, choose one thing and then bump it up like one notch. So if you're trying to decide between doing like environmental science or geology, um, then choose geology, like do the harder of the two. Uh, because I think it's so easy to default. I mean, especially for girls to default to what you feel more comfortable in um, because the, you think you'll be able to excel in it. And I, I just am a proponent for always choosing the harder option on the earlier side so that on the later end, um, you have more options. I love that. Yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. Um, Tim, what about you? Piece of advice? Yeah, I do have one and it kind of links to what Carmina said. Um, I think a lot of us here, Carmina, Devin, we're like we, our careers aren't exactly the easiest. Uh, these degrees aren't exactly the most easiest to um, achieve. And there has been a lot of road bumps, I'm sure for all of us going there. Like for me, like I haven't ever been very a very good student, pretty much like a B student in high school, B and C student throughout college. And I think as long as you are persistent and you keep working at what you are passionate about, you'll eventually get there. And I think the most important thing, like given with a society where it's easy to compare yourself with other people, I think it's important to compare yourself with like who you were yesterday and make sure that you make incremental progress to what you wanna do. So if you're passionate about the environment, just try to make incremental processes every single day to get you where you want to get to. And I think eventually you'll get there and just block out the whole, just tunnel vision on yourself and compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Thank you, Tim. And then Devin. Yeah, um, both great advice. Um, and I think what Tim said is, is really important that you know, you don't need to be, you don't need to have a 4.0 or be, you know, on the dean's list every semester to be, um, you know, good at your job. Um, you know, I found through school, I, you know, wasn't a great student either, but, you know, I, I seem to be doing well in my job. Um, and so just to know that you don't have to be, you know, the best in school, you know, high school or college um, to have, you know, a successful career. And then um, just, you know, if you're interested in any type of environmental science, um, engineering, any of that, I think the best thing is just like join clubs, see like if there are local organizations where you can get some exposure, um, you know, attend, you know, 
webinars like these that give you an idea of what different careers are about. Um, because, you know, like you had mentioned, uh, there's so much to just within, you know, water resources and water quality protection um, that people might not be aware of. So just trying to just figure out and um, try as many different things as possible, you know, change your major a couple of times in college if you need to, um, just, uh, yeah, ex explore. Great, thank you so much. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up. Thank you so much, uh, Devin, Tim, Carmina. I really appreciate you all taking the time uh, to join us. And I don't know if you can hear, but my dog is whining to, to want to go out right now. So <laughs> he's telling us that we have to wrap it up. Um, <laughs> so, and I, he's the boss. So thank okay. you so much. I really appreciate all of your time. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. It was a great time. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Thanks for having us.